Australia, the oldest, most extreme continent on Earth. Nowhere else do you find snakes more venomous, wildlife more bizarre. Over tens of thousands of years, people have adapted to this untamed land. They have endured its extremes and gradually learned to love it. From the rich jungle, to the red desert, to the snowy mountains. But in this vast island of wild beauty, the crowning jewels are Australia's national parks. Every March, off the West Australian coast, mysterious visitors arrive. The biggest fish in the sea, the whale shark. Suddenly, the giant animals appear as if from nowhere. A short time later, they disappear back into the ocean depths. Mark Meekin has set himself the goal of exploring the life cycle of this enigmatic creature. Every autumn for the past 10 years, Mark and his marine biology team have come here to Ningaloo Reef. They've established their research station in an old shearing shed. I've been working on whale sharks since about 2001. Now every year here at Ningaloo, whale sharks turn up from March through to June. We don't really know why that happens. We don't really know where they come from and we don't know where they go to. And those are the key research questions we're trying to find out. A key event in the life cycle of the coral happens after the full moon in March. Only once or twice in a season, when the sea temperature is a warm 27 degrees, will the coral polyps release their sperm and eggs and the whale sharks enjoy the coral spawn. This 260 kilometre reef is now a dedicated marine reserve. In 2011, the entire reef and the surrounding terrestrial park was listed by UNESCO as the Ningaloo Coast World Heritage Site. Ningaloo Marine Park is extremely close to the mainland coast. The shallow continental shelf on which the reef sits, drops sharply into the deep ocean trench, just a few kilometres to the west. Despite the calm, shallow water, it's hard to spot the giant fish from a boat. The team needs an aircraft. Hey, okay, g'day Rollo. It's Mark Meekin here, Ningaloo Station, mate. Yeah, yeah, we've got a good day. Um, can you put the plane up for us, mate? Yeah, excellent. Overhead at uh, Ningaloo Station at about 11 o'clock. Cool, mate. Fantastic. See you then. Ciao. Mark has put together a dedicated team to study the life cycle of the whale shark. As a professor of marine biology, his enthusiasm for his subject inspires staff and students alike to make this extraordinary animal the focus of their professional lives. With 3D cameras and specialised data collecting devices, the crew goes out to the reef every day. This year, the effort is to understand the animal's longevity and how fast they grow. This is a 3D camera system. Inside each of these housings, there's a digital video. And out the front here, we've got a diode light that goes around and around. What that allows us to do is synchronise the frames in each of these cameras. And when we do that, we effectively get a 3D picture of each shark we film. When we do that, we can measure it. And that's great, because if we measure the same shark year in, year out, we get a growth rate. We get to work out how fast these animals are growing. One of their most important research tools yeah is a combination camera and radio transmitter. The device collects a range of important information about the whale shark's movements once they leave the protected waters of the reef. 
This is a camera system for the sharks. It's much more than a camera system though. Here's the camera here, but inside the body of it, it also records the exact position of the shark. It swims with the shark and in three dimensions records just how the shark is moving. Not only that, it also records temperature, depth, salinity, oxygen, and a whole bunch of other variables that'll tell us why the shark is doing what it's doing. So it's not just recording the shark's movement and seeing down there for us, it's also telling us why the shark is doing it. The reconnaissance aircraft reports the first whale shark, just 200 meters from the boat. Roger that, Jackie. Uh, you've got a whale shark at 10 o'clock at 200 meters, yeah? Mark, we've got a whale shark. 200 meters, 10 o'clock. The aircraft will try and keep track of it. Have you got it in sight still, Terry? Yeah, it's still there on the surface at 8 o'clock. Still at 10 meters. Terry, can you run us up on it? Uh, it's around at our 8 o'clock. Go, go, go. Ningaloo Reef is a highly complex ecosystem that plays a key role in the life of whale sharks. Before the researchers are able to get close, the giant fish submerges. She's going! Great, yeah. we'll have another try. Okay. I think it's only about 50 metres. All right. About 12 o'clock. It was a whale shark, but we didn't get on it. It dived. The plane's got it again, it's just over there, we're gonna have another go. So everyone needs to get back on board quick as can. The gentle giants are up to 18 metres long. Like baleen whales, they filter krill from the nutrient-rich water. Mark and his team have spent a decade investigating the largely unknown life of the world's largest species of shark. Why do they come every autumn to Ningaloo Reef? And where do they spend the rest of the year? After many attempts, the marine biologists finally succeed in getting close to a shark. The heavy 3D camera requires a lot of time and effort to shoot spatial pictures accurately. Mark will attempt to attach the camera tracking device to an insensitive fat layer near the dorsal fin. The device eventually detaches from the animal's skin and floats to the surface. And if all goes well, it will record images of its life. Since the 1990s, the western peninsula of Shark Bay has been cut off by a three kilometre long fence to form the Francois Perron National Park. At over a thousand square kilometres, it's one of the largest wildlife refuges in the world and complements the marine wilderness of Ningaloo. The fence protects the park from introduced predators such as foxes and feral cats. A break in the fence where the road passes over a cattle grid is guarded by an electronic German shepherd. There's a battle going on to save native animals that have almost been completely wiped out by feral predators. It's called the Eden Project. Nicole Godfrey has spent the past 12 years tending to these rare marsupials, mm -hmm. some of the last survivors of their species. Nicole nurtures these endangered banded hair wallabies that can only survive in the sanctuary of the park. We've tried reintroducing them here on Parent Peninsula inside the fence, but they're very, very predator sensitive. The reintroductions failed. 
Hair wallabies are the last surviving subfamily of the short-nosed wallabies. Until the arrival of the Europeans, they occupied the whole western part of the continent. The animals were breeding successfully when we released them, which meant that the vegetation recovered enough for them to be able to do so. But unfortunately, they're very predator naive. They look at her, she's very cute and fluffy and, and very small. And they basically will sit there and look at a cat or a fox as it walks up to them and stalks them. And, and they won't even realise what's happening. <laughs> With introduced European predators excluded, the National Park will become a new home for the hare wallabies. The refuge is named after the French explorer and zoologist Francois Perron, who himself was a would-be predator, plotting to take over Australia from the British. He arrived here with the French explorer Baudin in 1801. But Perron was planning an invasion of Port Jackson. Aborigines have lived here for around 30,000 years and have retained their language. Although the animals they hunted for food are nearly all gone. This rugged terrain has become one of the last frontiers for a nocturnal marsupial that very few Australians have ever seen. To most, the bilby is more of a myth than a reality since there are so few specimens left in the wild. To try and change public perception about the bilby, Easter bilbies are promoted as a substitute for chocolate Easter bunnies. Bilbies are the main attraction for visitors to the Eden Project breeding facility. To satisfy their curiosity, Nicole needs a willing accomplice. The star of the show is Lily. Nicole thinks her own personality has completely changed during the 12 years she's been trying to marry off the bilbies. Actually, I'm a bilby pimp, really. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lily's our stunt bilby. She gets to meet the children at school holiday presentations and at schools and we get the odd visitor and everything. She comes out to show everyone what a bilby looks like. These bilbies are treated like royalty. Every morning their enclosures are thoroughly cleaned. Later in the day, the temperature will rise to well over 30 degrees. This nutrient depleted soil contains iron oxide, so the red colour is actually rust. With an average of nine hours daily sunshine and a mere 18 centimetres of rain per year, only desert hardened plants, such as the widespread mulga acacia, are able to tolerate this harsh environment. Life here is marked by peace and serenity, the heat, the red sand and seclusion. Laura once moved down to the state capital, Perth. But after a month, she was back in Shark Bay. Mine, please. Like the animals, she decided she prefers the quiet life. These wallaby females will be tested for pregnancy in the morning. This is Monty that was, that was hand raised. But we'll hang on to her for a while because she's good breeding stock. Here he comes now. Homestead 
was a sheep farm for more than 100 years. The whole peninsula was grazed until 1990, when the National Park was created. The farm was home to one of the hard-working pioneer families who came to Australia with dreams of making big money. Arthur Pepper is the last surviving son of the sheep farming family. His mother was a Malgana Aborigine from Shark Bay. Pep, as he is called, comes every day to the old shearing shed. That way we brought the sheep in here for shearing in these little small catching pens. They catch the sheep here, shear them, let them go out that way. Six shears, but um, they uh, done a good job six years, sure about seven, eight hundred a day. But uh, things were pretty tough in those old days in these old shearing sheds. But a lot of the old shearers say uh, same ones come back every year and um, they liked it up here. Mix in with the locals, go fishing and all that sort of thing. Twice every year, the sheep shearing was the big event. That little machine, much the same as cut your hair. Go on here. That little machine goes on there. There's a couple of bits missing off that little machine, but that's the type of one we used to do the, do the shearing with. Then the sheep was finished, you throw him out in that little pen there then, let him go. A good shear average uh, 140, 50, some do 200 of course, but average shear about 130, 40, whatever. Some more than others, some 200 or a bit over, whatever. But, uh, we saw 15 or 20,000 sheep, it'd take them about three, three or four weeks to shear that many. Uh, looking at about 800, 700, 800 a day. With the farm abandoned, the house has now become a museum of European pioneer life. Pep now lives in Denham, the only town for many miles around. Here he's got plenty of friends to look after him. But he leads a very independent life, having lived most of his 80 years alone. Pep fondly remembers the good old days when friendship was of a more fundamental kind, when all you needed to survive in outback Australia were some basic instincts and a rabbit trap. He gets a good pension, but a life of luxury has no interest for him. What really counts are his memories of a happy childhood with his white father and an Aboriginal mother. Yeah, that's my old father, legendary Bushman. The family there, mum, dad, all the kids, sisters and their husbands. Yeah, this little house here, that's where we lived when we were kids there. Looks a bit rough, but it was a good little home to all of us. We had a good relationship there. We as kids, we all lived good together. We, our mother and father was good to us kids. What difficult conditions we lived under in those days. But we were, we were happy living there. We had plenty of um, pets and that. I had a couple of Shetland ponies and a dog and pet sheep and goat. What were once domestic animals have now become destructive pests. Twice a year, poison baits are dropped to kill unwanted feral species, like goats, cats and foxes. This expensive but effective operation requires a specially converted plane and a large supply of poison baits. These look like air-dried salamis, but are mixed with lethal 1080 or sodium fluoroacetate. 
This poison is particularly effective against feral mammals. It occurs naturally in many Australian plants, but a sheep can die from eating a single leaf containing this toxic salt. Only from the air can you really appreciate the immense beauty of the large tidal lagoon and the almost completely closed salt lakes, paradise for anglers. The pilot, however, has little time to appreciate scenic beauty. A large number of baits are needed to reduce the feral population enough so that endangered native animals will have a future back in the wild. It's morning and Nicole checks for pregnant females. The two hare wallabies retreated into the cage traps. They prefer to give birth in seclusion. There are only two surviving species of hare wallabies in Australia, on tiny isolated islands to the north of the national park. More offspring are urgently required. This female has been behaving for some time as if she was pregnant. In her pouch is a tiny, naked, blind baby. Medicine. Hmm? You should be looking fabulous again. You should be looking like a supermodel. It's just a little something you squeeze on the skin on the nape of the neck. It's actually, it's actually for puppies and kittens. I have a, a pretty good result actually in terms of joeys. We've got nine, nine banded hair wallaby pairs and of, of those nine plus a couple of extra females. Um, and of all of those, I think there's only two females that aren't breeding at the moment. So pretty, pretty happy about that. Then it's the bilby's turn. It's bedtime for the nocturnal animals. They snuggle up into their daytime roost. The animals sometimes develop infections. In the wild, the animals eat medicinal plants to heal their wounds. Here, Nicole must resort to the pharmacy. The other show bilby is named Pepper, after Arthur Pepper. And unfortunately, managed to get a secondary infection in it, which we've been treating. It can take a long time to heal bilby feet when they get injured. All right, ready by time. And now it's time for bed, until the next visitors arrive to admire the bilbies. Shark Bay, enclosed by two elongated peninsulas, is visible from space. Between these fingers of land, the warm shallow waters that glow in such stunning colors are the habitat of a number of special animals the largest and richest of their kind in the world. This is seagrass, and it feeds a very particular type of cow, the dugong, also known as the sea cow. It's rare elsewhere, but it thrives here. There are some 14,000 dugongs in the bay the greatest concentration in the ocean. The key to the dugong success is the lushness and sheer variety of the seagrasses. Today, the cows are being rounded up by marine zoologist Dave Holly and his team. Dave's mission is to locate and protect prime dugong habitat. Because dugongs forage over such large areas, 
the best way to discover their favourite spots is to track them by satellite. But first, the 300 kilogram animals must be fitted with radio transmitters. Certainly it's very stressful for the animal and that's, that's something that you know, I'm, I'm concerned with all the time. But we have a, a team that's good at it now. The whole procedure takes under 15 minutes, so um, you can't really get better than that. While Dave attaches the transmitter, at the other end, the dugong is having his whiskers shaved. The hairs provide DNA samples, revealing who is breeding and with whom. It's no easy task, especially when a venomous sea snake joins the party. The local Yadula Aborigines are joint partners in this project with the state government's Conservation and Land Management Department. The tag transmits a signal to satellites and that satellite then relays that information back to a base station and I can access that on the World Wide Web. Um, so I can sit in my office and, and pull up the, the last location of where the animal has been. It does look a bit cumbersome, but the tag's neutrally buoyant. Um, I've tried swimming with the tag and it's almost virtually unnoticeable. The dugong will wear the tag for about six weeks, an unwitting participant in the internet revolution, but helping scientists to ensure the future of the world's dugong population. Green sea turtles also inhabit these waters during the year, and the bay is a favourite breeding ground for the giant manta rays. Despite their imposing size, manta rays are harmless filter feeders. With a wingspan reaching five metres, they cruise the shallows. The pearl divers of Denham used to clean their nets on this beach, which today is known as Monkey Mire. Dolphins soon learned that here was a reliable source of food. Today, the dolphins of Monkey Mire are a popular local tourist attraction. Janet Mann keeps her boat well away from the crowds. She and her crew regularly come to Monkey Mire to carry out dolphin research. This year, they're studying a unique hunting technique that the local dolphins have developed. Today we'd like to find some of the tool-using dolphins, the spongers who wear these basket sponges on their beak and they use these to uh, ferret prey out of the seafloor and we're really interested in what they're up to because uh, they are the only tool-using dolphins in the world. Janet is an American scientist who's been coming here every winter for 25 years. Yeah. He is going a little crazy. She lost her baby last year. She's doing a weed rub now. Um, she's pregnant again. We don't really have a relationship with the dolphins in the sense that we, well, we know a lot about them, but they don't reciprocate. We're interested in their lives and they're not interested in ours. So I can't say I have any kind of relationship with them. But some of them I'm sort of more interested in others just because they're interesting animals. They do uh, funny things. An American scientist discovered the unusual dolphin population at Monkey Mire in 1982. Since then, an enthusiastic group of students comes on an idyllic working holiday every year to assist with the research. Like humans and primates, dolphins mature very slowly. The size of their brains is enormous, which no doubt accounts for the most complex social behaviour of any marine mammal. This is the main focus of Janet's study. This cabin 
has been the base for the dolphin research operation for the past 30 years. <laughs> Janet holds doctorates in psychology for both humans and animals. And almost no one has published more on bottlenose dolphins than she has. When I first started this research, I just wanted to know what was going on with dolphin life. And even though I know a lot, I still have so much more to learn. So I always feel like I could do this for the rest of my life and uh, I would know more, but I would never know what is inside a dolphin's brain. And I can't pretend to know. So I do have a lot of respect for the animals, but I respect all wildlife. I just feel privileged that they're allowing me to see what I can see. Recently, Eric Patterson has become a valuable team member. Not only because he's doing his doctorate on the dolphin's unique hunting method, but also because he's an excellent cook. Bibi and Phoebe are doing fine, and apparently Mimi and Pewee. Mimi is fine, and Pewee is fine, and. Uh, yeah. Okay. It wasn't one away, it was. My first blowy. Was t just took off right for her, and I started. Just, I was landing the boat, and I was just yelling, "Get out of the water! Get out of the water! Get out of the water!" And she was just standing there. She's about a fourteen-year-old girl. She didn't know what's going on. And I said, "You!" She looked at me. I said, "Yes, you! Get out of the water now!" And she just jumped back out of the water, and the blowfish beached itself, going after her, like landed right at her feet with its jaws going like this, <laughs> like this, <laughs> and. The de her dad came up and ran down, and I landed the boat, and I took, picked up the oar, and I just pushed the blowfish back in the water. And he, and he started yelling at me, like, why didn't you kill it? Why didn't you kill it? Even a dedicated marine biologist has some time for things other than fish. With its sun, beach and dolphins, Monkey Ma is a perfect holiday destination. Few people enjoying this natural wonderland are aware of the globally recognised research operation where marine mammals and marine researchers meet. The scientists are interested in two particular dolphin behaviours seen in Shark Bay. One is rare and the other exists nowhere else on Earth. Strand feeding is a very unusual feeding technique. A pod circles a school of fish and moves them close to the shore. Then the dolphins charge, driving both fish and themselves onto the beach, where they consume their stranded prey. The other group uses sponges as tools. Yeah, it's a pretty yellowy sponge. Soon, Eric spots one. This unique phenomenon wasn't studied in detail until Janet suggested Eric make it the subject of his doctoral thesis. She's right at the bow, Janet. It's female bias. We have seven male spongers, but we've had uh, about 48, approximately, uh, female spongers. And the few male spongers that do it are uh, interesting because most of the sons of spongers do not become spongers, but virtually all of the daughters of spongers become spongers. So it seems to be transmitted vertically, but primarily through the female line, so mother to daughter to granddaughter. Eric and his girlfriend Kate will replicate how the sponge hunting dolphins catch their prey. Since the water is only shallow, they use a compressor line which pumps breathable air to the ocean floor. You have a on that. Kate is concerned because the tide is flowing very rapidly through the channel. <laughs> seems to be pretty strong, we're anchored, but um, it's going to be kind of a drift dive that we're floating along because the current's so strong. Sure. 
motor. The only time we dive is when we're doing uh, substrate sampling like this or doing uh, underwater transects or trying to check out their environment, but the dolphins aren't here. Sometimes they come and check us out, but they don't come within in visual contact of us. They know we're here, but we don't know they're here when we're in the water. With Janet monitoring the flow rate of the ebbing tide, Eric and Kate mimic the snout of a bottlenose dolphin as it uses a sponge to churn the loose sand. Small fish wriggle into the sand when they sense a dolphin approaching. But the action of the sponge disturbs them. The fish flee and the dolphin gobbles them up. Eric is making a movie as part of his scientific study. Finally, he collects a sample of the sand to learn about the habitat of the dolphin's prey. Eric's key research involves the evolution of behaviour. <coughs> he wants to know if this form of hunting becomes commonplace. Will more families of dolphins First. imitate this behaviour? Or will they split from the sponge hunters? If significant numbers of new dolphins learn this adapted behaviour, this could be the beginning of a completely new theory of speciation. They use the tools, um, and that's probably because it's just a different way to make a living. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ways to forage in Shark Bay, but it is the only case of tool using in any uh, wild cetacean that's well documented. Uh, dolphins in particular have such large brains, you sort of would expect them to use tools uh, to some degree, comparing it to, say, primates or chimpanzees, um, great apes that are the other tool main tool users that we see. Eric has discovered a particular coarse quality of the sand in areas the sponge hunting dolphins favour. His work has revealed how the dolphins find their food. If you look at some of the uh, sediment that we got from the channels, it's really thick. Um, there's a lot of shells and big pieces of sand. It would be kind of abrasive. It'd also be hard to echolocate through because it's really sort of rocky. There's a lot of shell and debris in there. But if you look at some of the sediment from the open areas, the deep open areas where they don't sponge forage, um, you can see it really just looks like silt, almost like mud or clay. It's really soft. So not only is that not going to injure a dolphin if it's poking its beak around in it, uh, but it'd be much easier to echolocate through. For millions of years, the sand has blown from the east over the rust-red rock bottom. Shark Bay displays one of the most incredibly vivid colours on the entire continent of Australia. The warm, enclosed bay is much saltier than the ocean, the reason for another of its wonders. They look like rocks, but actually they're a form of bacteria. Hamlin Pool is a three and a half billion year step back to the dawn of life on Earth. These are stromatolites, the work of cyanobacteria, single cell microbes, one of the earliest forms of life on the planet. Hamlin Pool is the only place where they are found in such numbers. They survive here because the water is too salty for their predators. Nonetheless, growing just one millimetre a year, they are vulnerable. A camel wagon was driven through here over half a century ago. In this astonishing place, it comes as no surprise to find a beach made entirely of seashells. They come from a small mollusk, the cardiad cockle. Like stromatolites, its predators can't bear the salinity, so the cockle thrives.
The early settlers here used this abundant resource to build their houses on the bay. The crystal clear waters reveal more surprises from above. In the deep bays of the peninsula, the colourful salt is harvested in pens. Shark Bay is an important home for many bird species, like the ospreys, which saw the wind rising off the sloping cliffs, patrolling the coast in search of a meal. And the pied oyster catchers scour the tidal flats for food. Their probing beaks prize mollusks out of the sand. The ruddy turnstone, a migratory bird, rests here on its 10,000 kilometre return flight to Siberia. True to its name, it unearths marine creatures by overturning stones with its bill. The breakers roll in from the Indian Ocean to smash against Dirk Hartog Island, named by a Dutch navigator who landed here in 1616 and decided not to stay. When he left, he affixed a pewter plate to a post, now known as the Hartog Plate. 80 years later, in 1696, the Dutch explorer Willem de Flamin landed on the island and by chance found the plate, half buried in the sand. He replaced it with a new plate and took Hartog's original back to Amsterdam, where it now may be seen in the Rijksmuseum. Not far from the coast, the continental shelf drops off to deep water, an opportunity for the biggest fish in the sea to come close to shore. In spite of many failures, Mark Meekin comes back year after year. Ningaloo is a very special place because it's one of the few places where whale sharks aggregate right on the coast and we can access them using a small boat. That's fantastic. It's provided amazing insights into the lives of these animals. We've been able to put cameras on them and follow the sharks underwater using these camera systems. The information back from that's been incredible. We've seen the daily lives of whale sharks at the bottom of Ningaloo Reef. No one's ever done that before. Recently, the team managed to attach a camera to a whale shark. They hear the intermittent beeping of one of their transmitters. Is it one of the animals close by? Or is it one of the devices that has broken free and floated to the surface? Now it's time to try and find it. Oh yeah. That's nice, that's really strong. We got it. We got it, baby. Come to Papa. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah okay. Right, right ahead. Yeah, you got it. Directly ahead. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. You think so? It might have been a white cap. The device collects a range of important information about the whale shark's movements. All right, got it. Come. Yay. <laughs> The data is immediately analysed in the shearing shed laboratory. The bottom's barely moving there, see? And it's hard to know though, because he may be a fair way up off the bottom. Oh, they're going then! <laughs> bye bye, baitfish. <laughs> So we see here the Trevally have just started to devour the baitfish. They chase them all over the body of the shark. And the shark clearly doesn't like the attention of those things, them hitting the sides of its skin. And it's heading straight up to the surface. Here you can see the sun coming into view. So it's heading directly up to the surface. Now it's stopped, slowed down, and it's sinking backwards. And we can see the camera dragging along the skin of the shark. So you can see what's happened to the bait fish. We have uh, somewhat less than we started with. 
Now the whale shark's relaxing, it's starting to come back into a more normal posture in the Trevallia back. Each whale shark's spots are distinctive and are used to identify individuals. Some animals are very docile. Mark is feeling for small crabs that attach themselves to the shark's mouth. Since these are a great irritant, the shark seems to enjoy his attention, like some sort of cleaner fish. It's forbidden to dive with whale sharks using scuba tanks. Mark reaches the limit of his breathing capacity. Such cooperative behaviour astonishes even the most experienced of marine biologists. Well, that was pretty amazing. Not just for the fact I actually got a copepod, but the reaction of the shark when I did it. <laughs> I, I picked the copepod off and I just, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just actually rubbed the shark's lips and it locked it. I, I just kept doing it and the shark just, whoa, went stopped, went vertical and just hung there. I've never seen anything like it. It's just amazing. I, you know, all I can think is the sharks out there, they've never seen a human before. They, they don't know what we are. The crew back on board. The captain navigates to deeper waters. Mark is excited that he's captured a couple of the parasitic crabs. The capopod's parasitic. It eats the skin of the whale shark. But what we're interested in is the genetics of those copepods because they may tell us where that shark has come from. By, by looking at the genetics of its parasites, we may be able to track where the shark's coming from. This is a great mystery. The life cycle of the whale shark is completely unknown. Where are their breeding grounds? Where do they give birth to their young? And what are the main food sources of these giant tropical fish? One of Mark's next schemes is to fit the sharks with transmitters and find out how far and how deep they swim. Mark hopes that one day he'll be able to decipher the mystery of the whale shark to help teach people to respect the sea and love its inhabitants. It's an amazing and unique experience and I'm really hopeful that, that my work contributes to the conservation of this place in the future and that Maybe one day my kids can come here and experience it in exactly the same way I have. The old lighthouse that used to help ships navigate safely around the dangerous Ningaloo Reef is a good place to pick up the whale shark signals. If all goes well, this one will send back information for months about the depths of the ocean, a mysterious world that there is still so much to learn about. Ningaloo Reef and Shark Bay and the bright red landscape of the Francois Perron National Park is all now part of the UNESCO World Heritage Protection Zone a unique and fascinating area of the Earth's natural history has been preserved for the future in almost pristine condition. <laughs>